not be virtuous to say something about it. Yes. Uh, we first mount him in a very special way on a hinge. Then, at, when we begin, we dunk his head. Notice we dunk it once and take it out once. As I'm sometimes given to say, we could dunk it three times and take it out only twice, you know, a little jest. And now, what does he continue to do? He continues to bob down and drink, as one says, and come back. And after a little while, he bobs again and comes back. He oscillates here with a damp harmonic motion, which is wonderful to speak about mathematically. And we wish to know, why does he work? Let's look at a picture I drew on the board, which I hope would make it a little clear. Notice, gentlemen, Mr. Harris and Mr. Prentice. A bulb, a shaft, hollow, and a head, which is hollow. Running along the whole neck shaft, is a little tube. Do you see? I've tried to draw it in there. Yes. In his belly resides a volatile liquid, like acetone. That means it vaporizes very readily, okay. right? Now, let us imagine that he is upright, upright, and his head is wet. Will there not be evaporation from his head? Mm -hmm. Evaporation. Indeed, if I turn a fan on him or put him in the sunlight, he works very much faster, suggesting that the rate of evaporation governs the frequency of his yeah, oscillation. Yes. So he evaporates the water from the outside of his head. This makes the head inside cooler. This reduces the pressure in his head. The vapor pressure here, remember there's vapor here because this is highly volatile, and because this is in uh, receiving uh, radiant energy of some sort, is not the vapor pressure increasing? Yes. The vapor pressure then, when this tube is below the level here, drives some of the liquid up. And indeed, if you look closely at his neck, you see it climbing, 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 climbing. Isn't it clear that when some gets in his head, Mr. Harris, he's going to be heavy enough to tip over? Yes. Now what happens? When he tips over, will not the end of this tube be out of the liquid? Yes. Will it not run back? Yes. And therefore, he comes upright again. Do you see the mechanism of his operation, Mr. Harris? Yes. Yeah, let's go take a look, because I like this. This enchants me. Look at him. Look at him right there. Look, look, watch now. Watch, watch, watch. Down, because his head is getting heavier. Uh, down, down, down. I named him Felix, incidentally, and that's long before I knew you. I hope you're not troubled by that, Felix. <laughs> no. Isn't that wonderful? Right. So there is the history of the dunking duck. Now, would you believe it? Some people have them in America on their lawns. Enormous, like a big man. How do you think I'd behave as if hinged that way, eh, Harris? Now let's go over. Let me get behind you. Stay right there. Now I'm going to talk about something that enchants us in a wonderful way. Bubbles. Have you ever blown soap bubbles, Harris? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm going to blow some now that have a different complexion. You know, you can mix up soap solution, mm. or there are commercial kinds that you buy, and you have a little mm. pipe, and you dip it, and then you, and you get a bubble. Mm. Bubble may be that big. What shape is the bubble always? Spherical. Always spherical. Dewdrops are always spherical. Raindrops are always spherical, unless they collide with others and get deformed. And we ask, why are these things always spherical? And the answer is, it lies in the word energy. So you see, I'm hinting at something for you to study with your master. Now I have some special soap solution in this vessel here. And here's a frame that's about what? N nine inches in diameter. Step back a little, if you will. Good. Watch it now. Watch. Watch. Do you see I have? Notice the high elastic property of that surface, Mr. Harris. Oh, look. Now watch. Oh, what shape is that? Spherical. Now watch. Oh, I lost that one. There we are. There we are. Look at that. Look at that. Isn't that terrific? Look at that. Look at And look at the colors. So I must remind you. I must remind you, Felix. The color of it. The color. The colors of the rainbow. Due to interference and refraction. And selective absorption. Do you see how much optics there is in this subject? Yes. Remember, who discovered the nature of white light? Who? Who? Oh, you trouble me in my little belly. Isaac Newton. 
In the year 1665, I procured me a triangular glass prism with which to try the celebrated phenomena of colors. And for this purpose, I cut me a slit in my window shut to let in an appropriate measure of the sun's light. Then the light fell on the prism, and then on the yonder wall, he saw red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and violet. And what did he say? It was at first a pretty divertisement. See, a, a, a th an interesting thing, an interesting thing. But then when I began to examine it more circumspectly, and thus was born his theory of light. Well, let me make some more. Do you see how wonderful it is to know what these men said about their work? And of all the things that Isaac Newton said, did, invented the calculus, discovered the law of gravitation, the laws of motion of mechanics, the nature of white light, what do you think? Oh, uh, invented the calculus, I said that, yeah. <laughs> what did he think was his greatest achievement? Discovering the nature of white light. By all means, he said, by all means. The, I've forgotten the exact words now, I'm a little pressed for that. Uh, yes, the most profound of all the operations of nature. So when you go outside and you see the sunlight, which looks white, what color is it really? Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and violet. Mm. Right, so go read a biography of Newton. Watch it now. There's one. Oh, there's another. Look at, oh, I nearly had two. Look at that. Isn't that terrific? Isn't that wonderful? Look at that. So, there's a good one. And notice, as long as I can keep it rotating a little bit about some axis, it will aid its stability. Look at that. Look at that. Gone. There's a good one. Notice, however much it rotates, gentlemen, and however much it gets deformed, does it not always end up how? Spherical, spherical, spherical. Yes, and I'm going to make one more. Why, Mr. Felix, am I going to make one more? Um, it's interesting. It's, I'm having fun with it, Mr. Harris. He shouldn't be a week in coming up with an answer. There is one more, two more, smaller ones. Yes, and I say, this is wonderful to, to think about. Let me get in the middle here. Finally, finally, a little, a little jesting tale. You know what termites are. We spoke about them on, a, on an earlier program. Do you know, by the way, what a termite's nightmare is? Can you imagine what a termite's nightmare might be? You know what a nightmare is. You know, you toss yeah. in the night and you wonder how you're going to work with the professor and, you know, yeah. you're all shaken, yeah. Hardwood. Hardwood, very pretty good. Termite's nightmare. I dreamt I dwelt in marble halls. How do you like that? And now, finally, what is this, mister? Mint. Why do I have it? Why do I have it? Because it smells so strongly. Thus, now what happens when I crush it? Most. More. Why? Because I have freed its vapor so that it can disperse in the atmosphere more abundantly. So we are catching on our olfactory nerves some of the vapor of the plant. That's what smelling is. Okay. Right. Okay. And so, thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Harris. Harris, and a copy of my milligram book Thanks, for you. And thank you, Felix. And we may, I say may, come back another time. I have uh, some 50 toys yet left, and unless I am sent away from Australia, I may uh, return to do some more.